this week for pull requests. I saw two new ones. Um, the first is Corey's excellent investigative work and subsequent PR for uh, looking at setting upper and lower bounds on RocksDB OMAP iterators. Um, Casey is reviewing that and uh, offered some really good suggestions there for avoiding uh, copies and, uh, and memory leaks. So that's good. Um, I figure, Corey, well, we can talk about that maybe after we go through pull requests since it, it deserves a, a longer uh, lot of time. Um, and then the other new one that it's kind of tangentially performance related, but um, there was a PR that came in to allow RGW to use Deos as a backend. And, and for folks that don't know, Deos is um, <clears throat> kind of an offshoot of Luster <clears throat> where they, um, they, they actually use stuff as some inspiration for when, uh, when they started writing it. Um, it's a, an object-based store that uh, is really focused on, on high performance, uh, uh, kind of tied to Optane drives to some extent. Um, but it's, uh, it's still fairly experimental from what I, I, I think they, they can only barely have replication actually at this point. Um, but, uh, but, but it is there and it is really high performance in some scenarios. So uh, it looks like someone is working on trying to make a, a storage abstraction layer for that for RGW. That, that's really interesting. Um, it would absolutely be interesting to see uh, what what that does and how it works and how it compares to our own uh, OSDs, and you know maybe we'll learn something from it. So um, definitely interesting work there. Um, there were two closed PRs this week. Uh, one was from me. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit later on as well, but this is um, uh, basically the minimalist uh, fix that we can implement right now for what, the, what we did in a previous uh, change to the AVL allocator. Uh, basically, last summer in PR uh, 41615, uh, we, we made a change to the AVL allocator where we limited uh, how, uh, how, not how long, but uh, how many bytes or how many cycles it would spend searching in near fit mode and then switch to best fit mode. The problem is that we would leave the current position that we were searching from the same if we, if we gave up. So if we gave up, we wouldn't update the cursor position and we'd end up for every allocation request, continuing from that same position and 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 failing. Um, so this is kind of the minimalist PR to change that behavior, and and that fixes some issues that we saw in Quincy. Uh, so that's basically what that is. Um, moving on, uh, the other closed PR was basically a, an earlier attempt to fix the same thing by changing or reverting uh, some of the changes that we made there. And that just got closed because we, we superseded it with this new PR. Um, three PRs that I saw were updated. Um, first is another one for me that, that changes the AVL allocator to do a time-based uh, 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 threshold on staying in near fit instead of the current byte and cycle or count uh, for, for staying in near fit. Um, there's also an update on this tracing PR. Um, I think uh, Deepika reviewed that and there have been some updates it looks like, not sure exactly what. Um, and then Adam's uh, PR uh, uh, here, this, I, I've got the world on a string sitting on a rainbow PR. Uh, I think parts of that maybe have been merged in other PRs and it looks like Matt's just asking here if there's anything left from that. Um, Adam, is my, is Adam here? Yeah, Adam, is there anything I'm, did I get that right? Is it basically just that we're trying to figure out if there's, there's still anything from that PR to merge in? Which PR is this? I've got the world on a string sitting on a rainbow. PR 31. Um, there are 
things from that, but they pretty much need to be uh, redone. Uh, Casey made a much better uh, string iterator class that's more idiomatic. Um, so yeah, most of that can probably uh, go, and it should also probably just be broken out. Sure, sure. Yeah, Matt was just asking in there. I think he's wondering if we should close it or not. Yeah, I think we can. Oh, and Matt's here too. Awesome. Okay, cool. Uh, lots of stuff in the no movement category. Uh, but I don't think anything there's there's anything here that's super. Okay, so uh, someone uh, asked in the uh, in, in the discussion topics if we should continue PG log discussion. I suspect maybe that was Gabby, uh, but Gabby is not here yet. Maybe no, it was me. So oh, it's probably a discussion to have with Gabby. It just seems okay. like a good CDS topic. Maybe it'll show up next week. Sure. Uh, it's possible, too, that CORE is still ongoing for some So he might be here in a little bit. So let's, let's wait a little bit on that one. Um, so, okay, uh, I'll move on to the next topic then. Uh, so recapping ABL allocator changes, I kind of already talked a little bit about what we did for this minimalist change. I still think there is a valid reason to change the way that we are limiting or the, the way that, that we are um, switching into uh, the best fit mode from near fit. Even with this kind of minimalist change, uh, we still see us dropping into near fit really quickly and often even sometimes on like 4K searches. Um, and it's just a result of, of the, the limits that we have in place. Uh, we can increase those, but it's really unclear how many bytes forward we should search or how many cycles or, or times we should iterate uh, the search in near fit mode before giving up. So this other PR I have uh, that, um, that basically changes to a time-based uh, search I'll copy that and paste it in the chat window here. Uh, personally, this makes a lot more sense to me. Here, instead, we're basically just limiting the search to a certain number of, uh, well, I think you can go down to, to microseconds. I don't know if they have seconds it would solve to or not, but um, you know, certainly down to the microsecond level, we can say, okay, this is how long we want to search in in near fit before giving up. And that's, to me, a lot easier to tune. Um, when we do that, if we tune at like around 100 microseconds, we see that the number of searches uh, that fail, the number of near fit searches that fail goes way down. If we set it to like 10 microseconds, we actually have, I think, fewer misses than we do currently when we're only setting like 16 megabytes forward or 100 iterations, um, but it's still pretty high. Like you can kind of see that the curve uh, kind of goes up. It probably is kind of something that looks a little bit like an exponential curve. Um, so I'd argue that at the very least we should increase the defaults and, and preferably from my standpoint, we change it to a, a time-based search so that we're not trying to tune on multiple axes at once. Um, I see more people have shown up. Um, Igor, I, I don't know if you heard most of that discussion, but I still think we should probably change to like a time-based limit on AVL near fit searches rather than this kind of two dimension bytes and, and number of iterations. Um, any, any thoughts? Well, maybe, can, can, can we support both uh, limits for, for a while? Uh, just to make sure this time-based uh, limit works properly and then maybe get rid of bytes limit. Right now, if we keep the current defaults, we'll, we won't hit a 10 microsecond time limit. We'll, we'll easily um, uh, hit those byte or cycle limits first, I think. No, I mean, uh, if I remember correctly, you removed uh, byte limit with your PR. Yes, right. we just base it on so, time. So, so maybe can 
preserve this functionality and well just disable it by configuration settings and just make sure that time-based limit works perfectly in the field uh, before getting rid of uh, byte limit completely. I mean, the, the, the current code we have isn't even in the field, right? Um, you mean Is byte this... limit? Uh, so byte limits are present in uh, Pacific dot seven, if I remember correctly. I thought we didn't merge that PR until I think it's in two eight. Right. I don't think it's in two seven. I see. You're talking about those options, right? The avial allocator options that you were trying to revert, Mark. Those are not there in sixteen to seven. Yeah, that was my thought too. Uh, that was my recollection as well. So from user experience, it definitely makes more sense to, to have time limit based limits. Uh, and even from our own perspective, I don't know that we can reasonably <clears throat> set defaults. Like there's there's no there's no rhyme or reason why you would set like a 16 megabyte or 100 iteration limit, right? Like. Oh, it, oh, oh, oh. Well, I believe this was borrowed from ZFS as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm seeing the ZFS guys are doing it wrong, uh, <laughs> I guess. I'm, I'm being a little arrogant here, I guess, but it, it it doesn't strike me that there's any real good way to use those limits on a variety of different hardware reasonably. Like, it, it changes. Like, what you want to set those to, depending on how fast your device is. But at least so, you don't have to enter a timer code <laughs> multiple times in this in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an allocation, which seems. Matthew, like if you look, it, look at the way I wrote it. I um I tried to avoid that by basically uh, starting out by doing eight uh, iterations per timer check, and then as you move on, you increase the number of iterations per timer check, assuming that you set a higher limit that you can go farther per. Per uh, per you know check at the timer. But wouldn't wouldn't there be a way though to to to, to heuristically convert the timer into a number of iterations or some search some some some, some constant time search counter type of thing? I mean, you could you could try to like grab and find out how many checks you can do in a certain amount of time, and then and then like iterate that at that resolution, right? I mean, I, we, we could do it that way. It's, it's, I don't know that we need to. I mean, this is a little sloppy. You see that, you know, sometimes you go a little over your timer setting. Um, you know, you might you might be like 10% over or something, but is it that big of a deal? I don't know. Yeah, I like uh, Matt's idea of adapting number of uh, steps of algorithm by time and then adapting your amount of steps how much time you you just make it adaptive that that will get give us just one uh, time read basically two time adam, reads per per action i think adam the the reason i don't necessarily like that unless you're rechecking it periodically is that if all of a sudden you start going slow you might have a lot of iterations to go through, right? Like the way I've written it, it makes it so that you you start out small and you kind of grow it each time so that if if it's for some reason all of a sudden going slow, then you start out with a low number of iterations so that you're you're not you can you can you know quickly jump out of the loop. But if you start with a high number of iterations and for some reason the background has started going slow, then you might have a lot of iterations to go through before you give up. I understand. That's why I like restarting this each time, even though, yes, you might have a couple more, um, you know, time checks involved. The, the rate that we're going at right now, it doesn't really matter, honestly. I mean, and, and wow. it's that's, that's dangerous. I, I, I yield the, the point, but 
but that's a dangerous point. You could you could tune it though, Matt. Right? I mean, like if if you start seeing it, if we get to the point where we're fast, you can increase the minimum number of iterations per per time check that you do. Like the the way it's written right now, that's that's tunable. It shouldn't be needed to be tuned until we actually see that being a problem. But um, you know, right now we're doing eight iterations minimum per per time check, up to a maximum of like, I think the the default I have there is 1024, 128, something like that. In wall clock profiling, I did not see it coming up right now at our our, our current like rate of 80,000 IOPS on a given OSD as a, a problem. Like it wasn't even showing up in the trace. Well, I assume that sweet spot of that algorithm basically depends on how fast we are with getting clock time and how slow is one step of attempting allocation. And based on that, we could then decide which strategy is more um, risky for getting into some long, long times or overshooting uh, with performance when unnecessarily asking multiple times for a um, for time, multiple calls for time. Yeah, and keep in mind here too, right, that the, the overhead for a large IO is really different than for a small IO. Like if we add a, a couple of nanoseconds for a four megabyte allocation search that we're already descending down a like 800,000 node ATL tree, that the cost of that search in the ADL tree is a dominating factor, right? Whereas for like a 4K IO, IO, we might not have to search nearly as much, but we actually we actually surprisingly do a lot of searching in that tree for it. It's not good, but that's a different topic. Um, but even even there, right? That's when presumably you'd have a much faster time of finding a slot, um, you know, finding space. And hopefully you're not doing as many iterations, which means you're not calling get you know a, a time search. Um, I mean, hopefully, actually, one thing we should look at is um, maybe we do the upfront search of eight cycles without doing any time lookup. You know, that would be a, an optimization for this, right? Like the first time you just do it, and then you don't even call uh, a time search until you've done that first eight cycle or eight iteration search. Well, still related topic would be to actually think if the performance, CPU performance of allocator is an issue that we basically doing very bad having one lock for entire allocator and maybe that's some problem also we we creating here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like to to me when I've after looking at all of this code, like the a, a time lookup is like really minor compared to all the other all the other things that are going on here um like it i, I don't discount it matt i i know where you're coming from on this but like the, the, well, it, well, it, the sounds, it sounds like adam has got some <laughs> other interesting points there uh too a, 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 a giant a giant avl tree everything hits yeah right exactly <laughs> there's there's <laughs> there's something called concurrent avl and there's some other stuff yeah, so so I mean, like as I've looked at this, I've been kind of eyeballing, like, okay, maybe maybe we have, need to 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 rethink some of our strategy with some of some of the allocators here. Um, but but that's a much bigger topic. You know, very minorly here, what I, what I want is to um, make it fairly easy for people to tune, like not not have to understand like how far they want to search in this tree or how many iterations. They that's so meaningless to tune, um, you know, it'd, it'd be better if, you know, with some degree of accuracy, they could just say, okay, here's how long to spend in, in near fit before we give up. Um, that's easier, at least for me, to think about wrapping my head around. Um, but then the bigger picture of all of this, I think, is, okay, we, we need to avoid doing really deep searches in this tree. 
and and maybe we shouldn't be doing searches in a tree like this at all. Um, at least not an AVL tree, but that, that's that's a much bigger discussion and much bigger topic. AVL trees are good for searching in general, optimized for them, but but this one is huge. Well, and B tree is better, right? Or B plus tree is better in my mind for something like this, right? Where you have a wider a wider search rather than a deeper search. Not sure about that, but. Well, yeah, it, like, yeah, bigger topic to discuss, right? In any event, um, the fact that we're seeing misses on, with an empty disk for, a four, for like 4K allocations, like I see this, I see us actually giving up after searching forward, um, you know, 16 megabytes or even more than 16 megabytes. Um, and, and then just giving up and going into best fit. For a 4K allocation, that's surprising. Um, something seems still kind of off here to me. But in any event, uh, more to do there, um, definitely. So we have everyone from core now. Uh, oh, actually, any, any other, did anyone else want to Say anything regarding allocation stuff? Um, I think we we probably covered most of what I want to talk about there anyway. All right, so Sam, you you wanted to talk about PG log, continue that discussion, and I believe Gabby's here now. Uh, it just seems like a good topic for CDFs. Gabby, I understand you did some testing where you eliminated the PG info. Rights. I did. Um, I eliminated, but it, it was. I was testing something else. I, I realized that disabling column family B while increasing I/O performance caused some write amplification, about five percent X write amplification, which made absolutely no sense to me because. We write less data to RocksDB. How come it generates more data? Mark suggested that that might be a problem with PGLog. So I disabled PGLog, and when PGLog is disabled, I, I try the same thing running PGLog disabled and column family B, and PGLog disabled and no column family B. And this time I got the reverse result. No column B is 5% less write amplification than PG, than without it. Does it all make sense? Do you guys understand what I'm saying here? No, I don't really know what column family B is. Oh, sorry. The allocation map. The allocation map used to be stored in Rocks DB. The allocation <clears throat> my, map. Okay, got it. Yeah, so when my, my PR removed them from column family, so we don't write them to Rocks DB at all. But the, and the impact is about 20 to 25 percent extra IOPS in random write 4KB. But I found some strange artifact that write amplification is up by 5 percent, which is really counterintuitive. We remove, we, we stop writing to rocks to be the allocation map, and as a result, there is more data written to disk. And write amplification is a change in the ratio of the data being written, not the total amount. Yes. Change in the ratio. So <clears throat> we write the amplification for 4K write, I think it's about 5% higher with when we don't put the allocation map in RocksDB. Now, the, 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 the thinking is that by stopping allocation map from going to RocksDB, we made ourselves faster. And by being faster, we increase the distance between PGLog creation and PGLog deletion, because we are now able to, to push more information in the same amount of time. <clears throat> and that means that PGLog are now exist in more levels. 
So to test this ID, I disabled PGLog, and with PGLog disabled, I tried once writing a location map to RocksDB and once without that. With PGLog disabled, now I got uh, the result I was expecting, that when allocation maps are not going to RocksDB, we are doing 5% less disk uh, write. Does that, does that make more sense? Sure. What's the overall difference in IOPS if you disable PGLog? Uh, let me see. I mean, I'm asking because of the problem yeah, that the PGLog complicates RocksDB, then writing it to not RocksDB seems like a win. Yes. Um, I'm just looking for the email I wrote. <clears throat> I think there's about 20% extra IOPS on top of no column B. On top of my changes to location, there's 20% more IOPS, but Adam was telling me that I only disable the PG log entry, but I did not disable the tombstones creation. I need to double check this thing. But there is at least 20% extra IOPS when PG log are disabled. Mm. So have, it seems like the next step would be to prototype the approach I outlined in that email. Yeah, so I try, actually, I, I wanted to contact you about it. <clears throat> I'm still not sure I fully understand what you mean. So you intend for the data to reach RocksDB under different object and all the PG log would be a single object in RocksDB? Sorry, it would never PG hit RocksDB at all. PG. Sorry? It would never hit RocksDB at all. Why would it hit RocksDB? I'm confused. Okay, so that thing I don't understand. Because we, we can implement our own ring buffer is what Sam suggests. I think. No, I, hang I on. Understand about the ring oh, no. buffer, I'm but... misremembering then. There's data in Blue Store that isn't in RocksDB. In fact, yes, most data in Blue that, Store but... is not in RocksDB. But unless we push the data to the right ahead log, then we yeah. have to write. Do we have any other mechanism using the right ahead log of RocksDB? Yes, you are. You are. That that is correct. For this to work, the the rights would have to be written as deferred rights. Okay, so deferred right is essentially a RocksDB object. I don't know how it's currently implemented. It's it is, a way it is. of... Deferred right is... is uh, then yes, it would only go into the... That, then that's, that's right, it would go into the, uh, the right ahead log RocksDB keys. But it's not... If you do the same mechanism, if you use the same mechanism we use for deferred right, and Adam, please correct me if I'm wrong, it means you need to update RocksDB, and RocksDB would write to the right ahead log. But my understanding is that with deferred right, when we do an update, we generate yet another object. Every update is just yet another object. Do you mean a key? Yes. I think that's right, yes. So what's the difference? What are we gaining by this change? Uh, the advantage is that it's going to the right ahead log, so it has the same lifetime semantics as the right ahead log. Yeah, if that's already that's a problem, right. no, that if right that's I already a problem that. for small rights, then we have a different problem. So I'm assuming in small right, we never try to be crazy optimal because Going to RocksDB by itself is a big win. PGLog is a different story because PGLog is extremely tiny object. Key. So, key and key. data. Yes. The data itself, I mean, I'm talking about the key, the key, I understand, but the data itself is extremely tiny. Very small, this, yes. Yes, I understand. But the word object also people. refers to Blue Store object, so I'd rather use the word key. Yeah. Um, so, I so the other option there. Sorry. 
So it's because the lifetimes are far shorter. Um, if it's actually still a problem, if trimming the write ahead log creates the same tombstone problems that the PG log does, then part two would be updating Blue Store to write directly to the write ahead log. I understand it's possible to co opt RocksDB's own log. Yes, you could separate RocksDB write ahead. Yeah, so doing this in two different steps. So the proposal is to use the data payload portion of Blue Store objects to store the PG log. That's part A. Yes, immediate, in the very short term, it would still be written to the write ahead log keys in RocksDB, but further optimizations to Blue Store would improve that pathway as well, eliminating that component. Um, I'm sorry, I'm saying you try to eliminate the, the write to the write ahead log? I'm saying you can change the way the write ahead log is implemented to write directly to a journal ring buffer. So change write ahead log and then PG log would only go to write ahead log without ever reaching RocksDB. RocksDB, yes, that would be the idea. But right okay, now, so. Blue Store uses RocksDB as its write ahead log. So it would be better to just use that mechanism and see how much of a benefit that gets us. The limiting the PG so log the isn't an actual that option you're right to now. Get is by moving away from Tombstone. So if I'm just trying to understand, we would still create effectively RocksDB object for PG log, but we're not going to use Tombstone because we're going to recycle the data, and by recycling, we eliminate the need for Tombstone. Maybe. I'm not sure how the write-ahead log works. If we're just writing keys to RocksDB and then immediately trimming them, then assuming it's doing its job well, I'm assuming that it's not creating tombstones, right? No, no. PG log. It is? It, no. It, it, the tombstones, the, the, the tombstone don't remove data inside the meme table. The tombstone only remove the object in the mere, sorry, in the, in, the, in the compaction process on disk. I don't even right. think so as long as it to... never, so the idea is that as long as it never makes it to disk, it never creates a tombstone. Is that the the idea? If you never make it to disk, you never create a tombstone. But how can you guarantee never going to disk? We don't need to guarantee it. which just needs to be with decently high probability. And I'm assuming that's why the write ahead log works the way it does now. That's the purpose so, behind this design. So that on average, the it does not make it. Log is full then all the main tables go to disk. That's the rule. There's nothing, there's no way around it. So I think what I'm saying is there are two problems here. The first is that we are writing the PG log into RocksDB directly as their own keys. That part is a problem because it more or less guarantees tombstones. So the first step is to change the Blue Store interface we're using to do writes to use a normal object payload. The second step is that if the write ahead log is an actual problem, then it's a problem for everything, not just the PG log. So the second step would be to change the way the, P, the write ahead log is implemented to write, to skip so rocks why is completely. The, why is the write ahead log problem? I thought the write ahead log is the whole benefit. You are is supposing that, that every entry that gets written to the write ahead log results in a tombstone, right? Mm, not exactly. No, that's not how it works. I didn't think it did. So I'm saying that if the right ahead log. Is... Right ahead log protects you against failures. That's of things you understand, of course. And it's allow you to bundle together multiple updates. So if you got object, because at the moment what you do, you write object node, PG info, and PG log. It's a, it's a single update to the right ahead log. An object node, we know that we need them. So we piggyback the PG log on the object node update to write ahead log, and that's the reason that we assumed that pushing them to RocksDB is going to be very cheap because write ahead log is the, is, the, is the actual cost, and that thing is piggybacked on the object node. What we didn't take into consideration is that Eventually, the mem table is being flushed and tombstone going to follow for every object. So if we could keep a single object, and when this thing is detached to disk, it's a still a single object, then that's the win. 
it at least going to reduce significantly the amount of tombstone because we will still need some tombstones and there is a very tricky management here because you cannot remove the data until you know that all the page all the pages inside it are safely re removed so there is a tricky work there but it is doable the question is I don't think RobsDB give you an interface where you can just write in cycle. You cannot go and keep growing an object. I think every update, I might be wrong here, but I think every has update- has to overwrite the whole key, yes, which is why I keep yes, saying, please use the, the word key and not object. So if um, we overwrite the whole thing, then what's the benefit? So, so if- There is no benefit, that's what I'm saying. So what I'm saying is we are using RocksDB's, a, a key range in RocksDB as a write-ahead log, right? Alternately, RocksDB has an interface it uses to access the sort of sequential write file that it uses for doing the write-ahead log in the first place. We yes, plumb that nice. through to BlueFS. What I'm suggesting is that if writing the PG log via Blue, uh, RocksDB keys becomes too expensive, we could bypass that layer and write it directly to the underlying journal buffer. Yes, it, it is doable, but it's very tricky. So that's one idea we suggested in the past. And we know that using this mode, the logic is very clear. It should fix the problem, except that that code is tricky to make right. Now there is another option I tried to, uh, to suggest and keeping the same semantics. So the option goes like this. <clears throat> Bundle PG log from different PGs. Don't differentiate between PGs. And when we need to create a new mechanism of PG log repository, once request arrive to the system, to the messenger, the messenger would create an entry in that mechanism. It will say, I need you to know that this object arrived, sorry, that this PG log can be created, but it's not committed. Only later, so that's in the messenger, and so it could push more and more update, but eventually when this thing reach execution, then it's going to say, I need you to commit it. By that time, the, the new mechanism would see how many objects it got, and it's going to bundle all of them together and create a single update of a bigger PG log. It's going to be PG log container. It's just going to flash everything it got into us in a single object. <clears throat> if, and, and, and by this, if we could aggregate multiple PG log updates and we could do four, maybe eight of them in one access, then we reduce the PG log overhead by a factor of four or eight. So that's Yeah, that's thing really complicated. That's really complicated. It spreads, out the, it spreads out the logic for dealing with the PG log across several components that currently don't have to worry about it at all. So, no, I it's don't think that's the that component, simple. right? The messenger tell me that you need to create a PG log, and in the execution, which is today, where you push the PG log, you just call the same interface and you tell it I need you to flash. And that you have a bunch of other there. problems. Like, for instance, you don't actually know what order those things are going to go to disk in. We haven't done the work yet to find out whether we can even serve that I.O. synchronously. It may still need to block on recovery or any of the other 10 things that, now it's much more complicated than, a, than that, that seems. Um, but I'll point out that it does exactly the same thing you would achieve if you instead wrote those PG log updates to a write ahead log and then batched them after the, the fact to write. It's the same thing, right? If you write the update to PG log, then you don't have to write them anywhere else. The PG log is the repository. No, because you have to write them atomically. The entire PG point log, of the PG, PG log, log is that the existence or after. Sorry, the existence, you write it to the PG log with the object node, so that's atomic. Yes, I know that. What I'm saying is that when you perform that write, you can write it to the write ahead log instead of to the actual, any final location of the PG log and then do the batching after the fact. You know, the batching normal way of doing left. things with the right. What's, what batching is left? If it's within the PG log, then we are good. We don't, I mean, we can maintain memory repository 
which let me put it this way a right a right to the pg log has to happen at the same time as the actual object right right the actual rados right that came from the client yes I will that take that, that you're more than that. So I, if I we're don't think up, if it's, if it's a must, but that's what we do today. It, yes, you must. You must, because the existence of the PG log must prove the existence or non-existence of the object right. They really do have to happen at the same time. Period. That's why we have a PG log. So if we batch up, let's say, eight client rights, those eight client rights cannot commit until their corresponding uh, until their corresponding log entries commit. So one way or another, we have to write those PG log entries with the corresponding object rights. The whole point of using a journal is to not, or one of the optimizations available to you if you use a journal is you don't actually have to do that. You can perform the rights as they as they show up with lower latency, and then after the fact retire the actual object data back to the corresponding buffers on disk, you know, like any normal file system. That's normally how you achieve batching because it doesn't introduce a bunch of extra latency on the client side. You see what I'm getting at? No, I do not. I don't understand what, what, what is that you batch in, in, in your design. At the moment, what we batch together is object node, PG log, PG info. And if we happen to have more of them, then we do them, but Usually, because the way we split things on the PG boundaries, if you got 128 PGs, then you're never going to have more than two of them on the same PG. You're never going to have more than two active works together. Right, which means if we chose to wait for more, we'd be delaying commit. Yes, if you decided that PG, you must write on, on the PG boundaries. You it doesn't matter whether you write on the PG boundaries. You'd still have to it wait does, for it other options. Because we have uh, 256 in-flight IOs, but if you look in every PG by average, it's about two in-flight per PG. But we don't do batching and within I, a PG anyway. I know, I know. The batching gets done in Blue Store. Blue Store, Blue Store sees all of the PG rights. It's not going to be able to batch more than two. In a lucky day, it's going to be two. Yes, but the reason for that isn't because it's split across PGs. It's because the total number of writes arriving is too slow to get larger batching. The only way you get larger batching is by introducing an artificial delay in the journal, which you could do. That's a valid choice. You could say the journal is going to simply wait until either 10 milliseconds or a certain amount of data accumulates. Not just the journal, the whole thing. The if you could, Sorry, the right ahead log, whatever. The thing that no, does no, no. the. I understand. When you say journal, I understand you mean right ahead log. But I'm saying the idea I'm trying to explain is if you could bundle multiple PG log entries and push them in a single PG log container, that's the win. Yes, but you because can only do that if single... you delay writes. You, it's the same problem. It just happens sure, in a okay. different layer. So you can delay write, but if you. If you allow PGs to be created not on the PG boundaries, and since you got 56 in flight, and then by waiting to four of them to aggregate, it's not a very huge delay. Again, yeah, but you can do exactly the same thing today, right now, in Blue Store. You don't have to do it in the Messenger. It doesn't even help you. So okay, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm just I'm just thinking uh, of maybe some solution that might be uh, more feasible with current architecture. In RocksDB, there is an ability to insert a merge operation. Could it be? Basically, I'm I guess I'm asking some. Do you think it would be possible to somehow create? keep having as many objects as we have PGs and reuse and create a merge operation that will basically modify that PG info log state uh, somehow and therefore just on, on writes only add that merge operation into write ahead log and if something 
goes wrong and we have to recover from failure, we will reconstruct on after uh, rereading right ahead log entire PG uh, info log state. Do you think that's feasible? The merge operator you you're discussing, I believe, is a way of you can create key update operations so that when RocksDB internally is doing level merges, it can look at the two different values and combine them in a way other than the newest one wins. Make sense? Um, I mean, it always uh, provides them in an order that they appear no, in the right headlock. That's what Adam, the merge operator does. That's what we're talking about. That's all Adam, it does. I think what you suggest is something we tried, and that's how the whole thing started. We try recycling the PG log. <clears throat> so we, we had a mapping from the real PG info to the PG log key, so we kept the same. We, we recycled the same keys, just keep doing updates. And at that uh -huh. time, the, it, this thing actually caused performance degradation. I don't remember why, but maybe we didn't spend enough time investigating why this thing happened. Because once it, it happened, we immediately changed course. But we did try this thing. And actually, yeah, I still have to out of it. Not really what I'm, but maybe, what I'm saying. Maybe we can, we can investigate. That was, I think, the first thing I, I, I've done when I joined. And when this thing didn't help, actually, it was causing degradation. We just left it. But maybe I can resurrect this thing and try to understand why we got this failure, uh, performance degradation. My thinking now might be that even if you keep recycling, at some point of time, that table is going to reach the disk, because every time the every time uh, the right ahead log is um, removed, is filled and then removed, then everything is flushed. So by recycling and never deleting that the thing at a time, we did recycling, never deleting, which I think maybe that was the problem. Maybe we should introduce a secondary garbage collector. But at the time, what we've done, we kept, I think, 3,000 entries in the PG log table, and everything was remapped, so we never had to do delete. But what happened is that when the right-hand log was removed, this thing arrived to disk. And then a few seconds later, this thing reached to disk. So every few seconds, we created entries which had never been removed. So maybe that was the problem. I think I mean, performance saw no improvement, and we saw right amplification. So let me ask this: um, Was that Igor talking before? Is there how hard actually is it to modify the way we do deferred writes so that they don't become rocks DB keys? Like, can we co-opt? RocksDB's write-ahead log mechanism to do direct writes to the to that circular buffer. It's not very simple to to separate. I know it's not. I mean, it is possible. It is possible, but once you do these things, you need to take control on the flash operation because once the write-ahead log is filled, <clears throat> then it's being removed, and you need to know that it's removed because once it's being removed, you need to store whatever you have in memory in some other space. Because the right ahead log is not uh, persistent storage. It's persistent I know. storage for yeah, a few I, seconds. Yeah. So whenever it's removed, you need to... To flush the, 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 the live PG log entries. Yes, I know. Sam, I think, I think that Igor's uh, plan to, to try looking at implementing our own right ahead log outside of RxDB has a lot of merit. Right. So, well, I have more or less working implementation at the moment, or POC at the moment. And the idea is, yeah, to, to replace RocksDB right ahead log with external one residing at Blue Store. Cool. Uh, and, well, I, I haven't analyzed that deeply about the idea about adding uh, this uh, log stuff 
Well, well you wouldn't well, need to. The simple version would be you simply write the log as a circular buffer to a to a normal, perfectly ordinary blue store object. So the writes would show up as deferred writes, like any other small write. Mm -hmm. So you don't need special handling. Yeah, well, I definitely need to think more about that. But well, the the different implementation for write ahead log well, close to, to the, the implementation is close to the end uh, to, to the completion. So hopefully we, we might be able to to use that somehow. That seems like a reasonable way to prototype it. Then once that's a little more ready. That would have that that would address your concern, Gabby, of needing to write to the yeah, proxy sure. keys we're using as the wall. Yeah, if I, I still I don't know uh, uh, Igor's uh, um, work plan, but if Igor would in fact replace or separate RocksDB write ahead log, then will be it will be positioned to be to make the other change. And I think after making the first change by separating write ahead log from RocksDB, then giving us a way to uh, store PG log without pushing them to RocksDB is an incremental improvement, which should not be very hard. But I'm just saying the first project is, it's not simple. And I don't know if Igor is working on this now for curiosity, or if it's something on his plane of record, and actually, Igor, you can answer this. Uh, well, well, yeah, I hope to release that soon. And the idea is to improve uh, Blue Star performance using that stuff. Uh, so I can definitely see that this key sync thread uh, is much less loaded this way. So. And well, in, in, in many cases, it's a bottleneck for booster performance. So yeah, my plan is to, to release that soon. Igor, I, now that this allocator stuff is starting to, to wind down, I, I do intend to test your, your code. I've got a, a branch sitting and waiting in a directory. <laughs> Hopefully this week, maybe today or tomorrow, I'll finally test it. Well, well, props to Igor, man. I think this this is this is this has been a dis this has been discussed by for so long. I mean, it's so it's so it's so exciting to see someone has prototyped. Matt, the so I, I very very briefly. Uh, else I heard earlier. <laughs> Sorry, what was that, Greg? Um, did I hear you right that you prototyped moving the PG log out of RocksDB completely, and you stopped because it increased. Are IOMS by 20%? No, he said that disabling it completely imp improved IOPS by 20%. No, actually, uh, I, let me speak for Igor. The number he showed me was by not disabling, replacing the right ahead log with his own design gave us an increase in IOPS by, I think, more than 25%. Oh, okay, this it, was the... This was on the slides. Okay, this was not moving the PG log somewhere. The number I okay. saw was 50%. Uh, well, 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 actually, my presentation covered two topics. And yeah. the okay. first one is about new write ahead log, and the second one is about uh, making, well, removing uh, PG log uh, implementation at all, along with all this replication stuff, and trying to estimate what's the overhead or in other words what's the benefit if there is no this yeah. logic at all okay yeah no i remember that presentation i i misheard what what, what was going on there okay never mind then in, in the past we have removed pg log entirely and seen pretty big wins out of it so it's, it's not totally unexpected um, yeah no, i i thought gabby had said that he moved the pg log out and it increased the number of IOPS being used by 20%, not uh, the, the IOPS that we were seeing on the set side. That means separating the PG log from RocksDB. RocksDB gives you the ability to provide your own PG log. 
So my understanding is this is what Igor was doing. Yeah. And, and so you when you write to RocksDB, you can tell RocksDB you don't have sorry, don't push anything to the log. I took care for this. Either because I don't care for persistency or because I did it myself. And I think right. this is what Igor done. Right, right. So we can we can disable embedded Shrugs DB right ahead lock on uh, DB instance startup. And hence, after that, we the uh, well, data consistency, consistency is on our plate. Uh, one one um, early attempt at this too, uh, uh, Lisa from Intel had tried to just write out um, PG log updates to 64K allocations in BlueFS, and um, she was not seeing any benefit to it, so she gave up on it pretty quickly. Uh, but it was never clear to me whether or not that was really a good test. And it sounds like Igor, you're you're having much better success with it with your. I think you're conflating PG log with write ahead log. She only was trying to do PG log writes to allocations in BlueFS and kept the RocksDB write ahead log. So she was just trying to move it out of that. Yeah, but but my implementation is uh, a bit different, so I exactly move everything related to write ahead log from. Yeah, yeah, and and maybe that's why why you're having better success. She did. All right. Well, we're we're at the the hour, guys. Uh, Corey, if you're still here, uh, I apologize we didn't get to do all of your excellent work. Um, I will I will have it as the the first topic for next week, if if that's okay with you. I see you're unmuted, Corey, but I don't hear you. All right, well, we are rapidly losing people. Um, so, oh, good, uh, Corey. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. And I, I want to uh, do your work justice because it, it's excellent. So um, next week, uh, first thing, let's let's talk about uh, your work uh, with RocksDB iterator boundaries. And um, and then, uh, you know, potentially we can continue this PG log discussion as well after that. So uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. And have a great week, everybody. Uh, a happy holiday weekend uh, for, for those that are, are celebrating it. And uh, we'll meet next week. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. See you, guys.